All right. Good evening, my friends, and welcome to Environmental Coffee House. It's great to see all of you. I see that there's a bunch of you joining me. Okay. So anyway, we've got a packed show, and let me say hi to who's with us, Tommyist and Kristen and Kim. Thank you for being my longest person. You've been with me the, as my moderator. Let's drink to Kim. Mm hmm. All right, we'll drink to Kim. Hi, Bella. Hi, hi. Um, I don't know if it's John or Jan. Um, Void. Hi, Stephen. All right. So, oh, Veg. Yes, it's great. Hello, Wanda, astrologer, climate witness. Wonderful. So it's been a very busy week around the world last week, and uh, you know. I peruse the internet and I'll watch political shows and, but actually really nobody does a recap of all of the environmental crap that is going on around the world. Honestly, it's just, um, it can be a little overwhelming, I think. So as you join me, I'll get this ready and we have to get started because there's a, well, it's busy. And, um, I just, again, I've been, I've been working outside and getting things ready while the weather was nice. There are, there's a lot of chores to do. And I know Poppy Davis, she's with, you're with us, right, Poppy? Yeah, she's doing it. We, we write to, a lot of us write to each other and commiserate about how much work we have to do outside. All right. But in the meantime, with all that work outside and everything else, let me set this up and, uh, We'll get going. Got a lot to look at. So as we know, this show is called Last Week in Collapse because Jerry Brock, the wonderful Jerry Brock, Jerry Brock puts it together. He does a fabulous job. And yours truly, Sandy Shellis, then reads and we go through from there because there's a lot of good stuff and so I like to pick out from what he does I like to pick out the uh the interesting stuff I, I, I want to share with you guys so here we go now strap on seriously strap on so much and here we go 7.2 earthquake struck Taiwan on Wednesday, killing nine, injuring hundreds, displacing thousands. Who knew that? A hailstorm in Pakistan killed at least 10 people. And then a tornado in India killed five and injured hundreds. Thousands of Russians evacuated after a dam burst due to snow melt. And actually, I thought I was going to show that. 4,000 people in Russia, in Kazakhstan, and they had to get out um, uh, in the southern Urals. We talk about that, Jennifer and I do every now and then, uh, due to the flooding. And I'm telling you, raise your hand. I wish we had a raise your hand button of who knew this was going on. Of course, unless you have the Guardian and you're looking at every single article, which does not happen for any of us. Emergency services had been working through the night after the dam burst in the city of Orksk on Friday after torrential rain. So it's happening, you know, it's happening everywhere. And as Looney Tunes in the chat was talking about, he lives in Louisiana and they are... Uh, in for a mess coming up. Louisiana gets hit so hard. Texas is in it, but Louisiana is where he lives. And I, I think about you there. So it's a shout out to our, our moderator, Looney Tunes as well. And uh, hi, Teddy. Cool. Okay. So Russia, they opened a criminal case for negligence, a violation of construction safety rules over the burst dam, which was built in 2014. The Orenburg regional governor, Denise Passler, said specialists assessed that the dam was built for a different weight and that the level of rainfall was exceptional. Now, of course, we know it's going to be exceptional all the time. Authorities said the situation was difficult throughout the region, warning of 
a dangerous water level on the Ural River in the main city of Orenburg. Now, the mayor of the city of a half a million people, Sergei Salman, said authorities would forcibly evacuate people from flooded zones if they refused to leave. He said the water level of the Ural has risen to 855 centimeters and will rise further. So, okay, you know, it's it sucks there, too. Uh, it's just it happening all over. And uh, when you said that you hadn't heard any of these astrologer climate witness, no, because not everybody does put it all together. <laughs> I'm happy he does it. And I'm happy to be able to narrate it, as I always say. All right. So we heard about the dam now, Australia is reportedly heading for multi-decade mega droughts. You've had to hear this. So we're going from too much rain to mega drought. In, and this was a new study that came out in the European Geoscience Union. Uh, the study claims that these mega droughts may happen even without man-made climate change as the region is trending to become drier. It was interesting. I did look at the study, but I'm not going to bring it up here because I really want to get to some of the other things. It was interesting, though, and they did have different attributions, and you can read it. It'll be in, in the um, show notes. So schools and crops wither as historic heat waves hit Southeast Asia. Yeah. Uh-huh. In central, in the Philippines, thousands. In central Myanmar, temperatures reached 44C, which is 111. In parts of the Philippines where temporary uh, pools were set up, pools, right? It got to 42C, 108 Fahrenheit. Now far away. And that's what this one was. This one was showing the pool seat that they put in because it's so hot. This is the future, folks. Children play in portable pools, a project from local government to beat the heat. But hopefully they don't get sick from each other. I mean, this is really uh, what's happening. What shoe? Oh, the, yeah, I did, Gary Hoover. I like the shoe commercials on the Guardian article. Yeah, it was on there. Um, let me put that up. Yes, we, we saw it. <laughs> All right. So that's what's happening. And I wonder if this is going to start happening in the southern United States when it gets so hot. Do you think? I don't know. It's uh, so in Burkina Faso, the temperature as 45, which is 113. Uh, it, it's, uh, setting a record for a heat wave. In Togo and Benin and other parts of West Africa, new records were set, monthly and or all time. A heat wave scorched Morocco with temperatures as high as 39C. And that, oh, I already had this one open, so that's good. Um, this one, heat wave expects to sweep across multiple provinces in Morocco. And the heat wave comes at the heels of Heavy rainfall, which caused floods in a number of cities in northern Morocco. In Rabat, several provinces in Morocco are sent to, uh, set to experience heat waves from Thursday to Saturday, according to the General Directorate of Meteorology in that country. In an orange level alert, DGM says the temperatures are predicted to soar between 34 and 39 C. The list of provinces affected, and they give the list, and that's a you know, a lot of places that people are, are just, people are suffering and records are being broken, friends. They are being broken. And while everybody here is screaming about Donald Trump and the court and all, people are really suffering all over the world. Austria experienced its earliest 28C day ever, beating the old record by 20 days. Now, Germany, that it finished its warmest march on record, as did Poland. Moscow set a daily record for heat as well. Record heat. So we'll talk about Russia twice tonight. Record heat, the dam, and now the heat. It grips Moscow. Moscow smashed a daily temperature record on Tuesday with thermometers in the Russian capital measuring a Balmy 23 Celsius. The previous record was born in, uh, broken in 1951, where the daily high for April 2nd in Moscow was 17.4. Now, remember, it's not 
this weather there right now. Uh, Tuesday's new historic high followed days of unseasonably warm weather throughout much of the European part of Russia, fueled by tropical air from the Mediterranean and North Africa, according to researchers at Moscow State University. At the start of the week, temperatures in the Russian capital had already climbed to 20.3, the earliest recorded temperature above 20 degrees in Moscow's history. According to chief scientist at Russia's Hydro Meteorological Center, Roman Vilfand, temperatures of 20 to 22 in Moscow are typical more for late May and early June. So it's, it's hot. It's hot. It may not, you know, feel like, okay, 70, 75, whatever, but that's an anomaly. It's definitely an anomaly. So the next, so then he moves on and we're going into the top three most heat trapping gases, CO2, CH4, NTO achieved record concentrations last year, says a NOAA report on greenhouse gases. So we were talking, Jennifer and I, on Friday night about methane, CH4, and you see how uh, it, it goes up from to 1900 and then this way 2020s look look where it's gone up. you could see it just keeps on going mm -hmm. yeah it's like it doesn't you know things they don't come down it doesn't seem like it does it and i'm not trying to be miss negative here i'm just giving you the facts facts as they are a group of scientists tested Oh, this is a good one. Marine cloud brightening. Now, you've had to have heard this one. A fairly controversial attempt at solar geoengineering on Tuesday. The process involves spraying a salty solution into the air in the hope that the particles will reflect solar radiation and thereby cool the planet or at least offset some of our record CO2 emissions. Analyzing the impact will likely take years, and the pioneers of this method estimate that 1,000 plus such machines might be necessary to do much. So there's one of those schemes that, like Jim talks about, the ocean schemes, and here we're talking about marine cloud brightening. Are these now, are we going over the line for these mitigating measures? Is it worse than we're being told? Well, uh, it could take years, right? And a thousand machines. And where do they put them? Experts claim that 10 football soccer's fields, soccer fields worth of forest are lost every minute. An area that is annually comparable to the size of Switzerland. Now, that's a lot. A study on Earth's energy imbalance concluded that surface warming will continue to accelerate as this century drags on. So we're going to look at this study. Recent reductions in aerosol emissions have increased Earth's energy imbalance. And this study, and then we're going to look at a little video, the Earth's energy imbalance is the net radiative flux at the top of the atmosphere. Climate model simulations suggest that the observed positive imbalance trend in the previous two decades is inconsistent with internal variability alone, and it's caused by anthropogenic forcing and the resulting climate system response. So, obviously, I'll just go back. We're out of the Holocene. We're seeing the heat and the anthropogenic forcing and the resulting climate system response. So here they're investigating the anthropogenic contributions to the imbalance trend using climate models forced with observed sea sur uh, surface temperature. And they found that the effective radiative forcing due to anthropogenic aerosol emission reductions has led to a, and this is their method, their unit of measuring which we don't have to understand. We just have to know that this is the unit and it's strengthening of the 2001-2019 imbalance trend. Now let's talk about these um, 
little radiative forcing a little bit. Okay, hang on one second. And here we go. Radiator, I'm very fascinated by all of that. This is an aerosol particle. In real life, you could barely see it. It's just a little speck suspended in the atmosphere anywhere from a few days to several years. It could be dust from a desert or salt from ocean spray. It could have been blasted out of a volcano or created during a forest fire. It might have flown out of a factory smokestack or a truck's tailpipe. Depending on what it is and where it is, an aerosol particle can do some impressive things, like cool the planet by reflecting sunlight back into space or by collecting water vapor to build a cloud. On the other hand, some aerosol particles trap sunlight and heat the air, thus preventing clouds from forming. Other aerosols can host chemical reactions that damage the ozone layer. And down on Earth, they can even cause health problems such as lung and heart disease. That layer of hazy air pollution above big cities, yup, it contains aerosol particles. Aerosols, they're tiny, they're powerful. NASA studies them with satellites and instruments on the International Space Station and with specialized aircraft and ground-based devices. Because when it comes to understanding our environment, our climate and how it's all changing, little particles make a big difference. All right, so there you go, a little simplistic little view of aerosols, and this is the science, this is the research that is discussing the Earth's energy imbalance, the EEI, it's the difference in the net downward shortwave radiative flux and outgoing longwave radiative flux at the top of the atmosphere. And the reason I'm interested in this ever since the uh, aerosol masking effect discussion came out years ago, but now it had been brought up by a lot more scientists. James Hansen, they're talking about the aerosols in the shipping fuel when it was removed. Our uh, atmosphere got a little bit warmer, but nobody's saying we want to stay on fossil fuels. We're simply saying that this is what happened because we poured so much crap into the atmosphere that now without it, it's it's almost like, well, we're going to get warmer because of all the other crap we've poured out of the atmosphere, as simplistically as I can say it. So that's why this is important work. And... It'll be in the show notes. Recent reductions in aerosol emissions have increased the, EE, the, the EEI. Interesting stuff. We'll do more on it. I promise. Okay. So really quickly, I just wanted to go into what radiative forcing is with this. Um, it's what happens when the amount of energy that enters the Earth's atmosphere is different from the amount of energy that leaves it. So energy travels in the form of radiation, solar radiation entering the atmosphere from the sun and infrared radiation exiting as heat. If more radiation is entering earth than leaving, as is happening today, then the atmosphere will warm up. And this is called radiative forcing because the difference in energy can force changes in the earth's climate. And this is a lot of what uh, there's uh, what Nate Hagen's channel talks about, um, what uh, they talk about energy, you know, but not just heating earth energy, also energy in, in use, you know, energy for our living styles but heat in sunlight's always shining on on half of the earth's surface some of the sunlight about 30 percent is reflected back to space the rest is absorbed by the planet but as with any warm object sitting in cold surroundings and space is a very cold place some energy from the earth is always radiating back out into space as heat the radiative forcing measures how much energy has come in from the sun compared to how much has left over a period of time. The analysis needed to pin down this exact number is very complicated. The factors are 
ice, clouds, polarized physical properties of gases in the atmosphere, they all have an effect on this balancing act and each has its own level of uncertainty and its own difficulties in being precisely measured. However, we do know that today more heat is coming in and going out. And what does Jim always talk about? He talks about the heat in the oceans. We talk about the heat in the oceans. So that's a little bit more on radiative forcing. But now we're going to get back to last week in collapse. We took our little foray into climate and radiative forcing. And now we're going to go into something that actually has come up around here. A friend here where I live makes goat milk soaps and things, uh, lotions, and he uses olive oil. And he was complaining today of the price and I had to explain to him about, he had no clue, you know, people would rather just blame it on the president and uh, not understand. And I looked up some information for him and I sent him information on drought and how that's affecting the olive oil that he's trying to get at Walmart, you know. So I did my little good thing today. Malaga olive oil production is way down due to drought, sending prices higher. Zimbabwe has declared a state of emergency because drought plaguing southern Africa and reducing it's it's reducing the harvest sizes. And what has been discussed, the coming food crisis and shortages because of the changing climate because of destroying habitat I'm always Sally Sunshine. Uh, Mexico. Now they're having a, in, and you probably heard of this because this, this has been, I think it's been in mainstream because it's me Mexico. They're in a breach of the water treaty with the U.S., which is reducing irrigation to southern Texas farms. You've had to have heard of this one. I mean, it's Texas after all, you know. <sighs> Please somebody tell me. <laughs> All right. Micronesia is approaching a water crisis within a few months, too, and a drought in Suriname. So this is a three-month satellite estimated total rainfall anomaly period from February 1st to April 2nd. There you go. You see? It's getting hot, baby. <laughs> and it's making droughts happen. <sighs> So we have floods and droughts. It's a, it's what happened in the world. Lima, Peru, the world's second largest desert city, population 11.5 million, is experiencing a worsening water crisis. 1.5 million residents in the capital city, megacity, lack access to fresh water, and the city's total water reserves will only last a few months in a worst-case scenario. Its river, the Rimac, is terribly polluted as well, leaching toxins into their dying soil in Peru. But you didn't know that one. All right, here we go into the disaster territory. The eight-page 2023 disaster in numbers. And this report was released last week, and it claims natural disaster-related deaths. About 86,500 were up about 33% when compared to the 20-year average, yet the total number of disaster-affected people is far lower than the 20-year average. The report says that 2023 had more earthquakes than average, as well as mass movement wet storms and wildfires. Yes, experienced fewer droughts, extreme temperatures, and floods. The dollar cost of all these disasters was slightly up in 2023, accounting for about $203 billion, half related to storms and a quarter related to earthquakes. So let's take a look at the economic losses here in this figure, which was from the article that I'm not going to open, but this is U.S. in billions compared to in comparative. So in the United States, the comparison is of uh, what 88.9 billion proportion of economic losses, which is 48.1% in 20 
in uh, 2003 to 2022 or 2023. So you see, Europe, the economic losses. Who do you think is going to deal with these, right? Now look down here, Turkey, Turkey, 34 billion. Jennifer and I did a show on that earthquake. Nobody liked it. We went over it thoroughly and talked about it. Things happening on the other side of the world affect us. Just like the saying, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. Well, what happens in Turkey doesn't stay there. And we're getting earthquakes in New York City. <laughs> and of course, people are talking about, well, that's because of the melting glaciers and the weight of the planet is shifting and changing. Yes. But so economic losses are becoming Morocco, Libya, USA, Mexico, Italy, China, uh, Syrian, a lot of places, big problems. And that's what wakes people up, though, is the money. And in the United States, the insurance industry is suffering, and they're cutting people off in Florida, and they're making the uh, the the expense of having insurance not even attainable for some people. Now, in in other countries, there may not even be insurance. I mean, we're in the spoiled brat, you know, whiny piss baby West. <laughs> the iceberg, codenamed A23A, is being tracked as it drifts northward into the Atlantic Ocean. A couple of weeks ago, the Arctic hit peak sea ice for the year. We talked about that, Freddie. And it's below average. Thank you, Rick Toman. Some industry experts are excited for the potential to lay new data cable <laughs> after more Arctic ice melts. Rising polar temperatures are prompting scientists to label the temperature phenomenon here to stay a regime shift, better defined as an abrupt change in the state of a system, which may or may not be associated with an irreversible change, which is what? A tipping point. <laughs> Did I kill you guys? <laughs> it's a tipping point. Did you have to cover your ears? Because that's how disturbing it is. And Extinction Rebellion's co-founder, Roger Hallam, who I am, hopefully it's coming up soon. We just have to set the exact date, was sentenced to 18 months in prison for leading a drone protest which temporarily disrupted Heathrow Airport. The sentence was suspended because of the protest's non-violent nature, because he is a civil disobedience guy. And uh, it'll be interesting to talk about that with him. You know, whether or not... Any of these climate defiance or any of these activist groups make a difference? I think they do to a degree, and I am with them all the way. I really am. I'm with them all the way. I, anything that disrupts the status quo, maybe, maybe. You know, people don't like, though. Uh, Roger has a lot of trolls on his Twitter feed, but it's getting better. Unfortunately, they... You know, people are ignorant and he's just trying to open their eyes. He's a very interesting guy. All right. So, and he was a farmer. That's, that I think is very cool about Roger. All right. The American conglomerate, we're going to talk about this one. 3M will begin paying out 12.5 billion as part of a court settlement over contaminating drinking water sources with PFAS, the so-called forever chemicals. And guess what? Tonight, the Environmental Coffee House flush of the day is PFAS. I'd like to flush them away. And I don't know. A wide-ranging study of bandages also found PFAS in 65%. You put a Band-Aid on and your, your body is <laughs> sucking in the PFAS. So I want to look at this. 3M gets final court approval for the 12.5 billion forever chemical settlement. Okay, so it's money. And is that really going to take the place of what has been done to the planet with these things? Shit's probably in my lipstick. 
Okay. Um, so 3M will start paying out the $12.5 billion forever chemical settlement with public water systems later this year after a federal judge finally gave approval. The settlement announced last summer will pay drinking water providers around the country for PFAS remediation over the next 12 years. 3M pioneered the use of PER and polyfluoroalkyl, uh, I can never say it right, substances 70 years ago, but is now reckoning with their environmental and health costs. And the older you are, the more you, this shit you've got because it started and it was there was no testing probably back when when all this stuff you know because they should have just labeled the band-aids pfaf's brand <laughs> there is this is yet another important step for 3m as we continue to deliver on our priorities roman said in a statement 3m is discontinuing its pfas production yeah okay by the end of 2025, way late. The water system settlement does not end all pending PFAS litigation against the company. And, and analysts have floated billions more in potential payouts in coming years. Payments are expected to begin this fall and will continue through 2036. The bulk of the payments will be made by 2028. Now, how about reparations for every human being on the planet? that has adjusted this shit in various different ways. How's that looking for us? Hmm. How about the wildlife that have ingested the shit by virtue of the fact that everybody threw their plastic crap out the window? 3M stock price rose 6% when adjusting for the impact of healthcare spinoff. Huh. That's a whole other one, healthcare. To close at 9402 on Monday, the Maplewood-based company has recast its historical stock prices to reflect a company without a healthcare division in order to make reasonable comparisons going forward. And I just thought of this, a healthcare provision after they've poisoned everyone on the fucking planet. <laughs> oh my God. All right. So there's our, our little PFAS uh, thing. Now, the collapse of a complex system isn't necessarily a simplification. The Lancet, they published a 14-page report on the intersection of global health threats, climate change, and biodiversity loss. See, so it all figures to health. Our health and wellness, animals' health and wellness, wildlife health and wellness. Although they're probably on the bottom of the, the list. For example, malaria spreads more in areas prone to flooding. Permafrost melting increases the risk of reactivated anthrax. Drought leads to greater foraging distances for bee species, putting them at risk of certain parasites. Storms and warmer weather endanger sea urchins. Fungal infections kill some trees. And that results in less carbon sequestered, topsoil depletion, and the destruction of animal habitats. Climate change worsens the bird flu, which if you're on Twitter, you've seen that one. So it's a, it's a circle. Climate change, biodiversity, infectious disease, anthropogenic. Well, there's that word again. You geologists that don't want to get out of the Holocene and don't want to tell us what's really going on. Host behavior, ecosystem services, thermal mismatch, pathogenic, pathogen development, time, and novel disease spread. That's what we're seeing. We're seeing it. I mean, I had been reading about other things going on in, in more depth than I'm going on here. Ecosystem services, deforestation or urbanization, trophic cascades, uh, temporal mismatch, food web dynamics, rain shifts, all of these in this layer. Species introductions, dilution or amplification and spillover, like they said what happened with the bats. Okay, and then species decline, parasite mediated competition, trophic cascade. So you can see the cyclical nature of all of these uh problems that are created as a result of pretty much human behavior and on this one the publication type theory literature empirical um 
and they they look at all of these different kinds of mechanisms that can happen, right? So I'm going to read this one because it's interesting. It's classification of 128 studies that discuss climate change, biodiversity, and infectious disease. Each study was scored for publication type ecosystem, which is the focal hack, habitat, taxon, focal organism, um, and mechanisms. So the study-specific mechanisms described in each publication were assigned to the broader mechanism, right, categories discussed in this synthesis. For example, studies that describe general increases in temperature and precip were included in the gradual climate change mechanism, whereas studies on extreme heat waves were included in the extreme clim uh, climactic events mechanism. The line width represents the number of studies. So it's 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 all it's all related. There's the literature, terrestrial, there. Look, viruses, vectors, pollinators, plants, parasites, microbiome, invertebrates, insect, fungi, fish, birds, animals, amphibians. All are being affected by different types of issues. Food web dyna uh, dynamics, gradual climate change, invasive species, and then novel disease spread like we just lived through. Yeah. Interesting, huh? Okay, so now we're going to move on to Canada and the little kerfuffle that's going on up there. Tensions grow in Canada over a modest carbon tax, adding 0 0.033 teeny bit cents per liter on petrol. A 13 cent petrol tax was imposed on Alberta as well. This tax among other things, threatening to sink the Liberal Party next election. So it's all about the gas. And clueless moron, drill, 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 people. It's all about the gas. Coffee and cocoa continue surging in price. Hmm. So you better, like, hoard your coffee. Sperm counts are dropping as temperature rises. High temperatures are also affecting women's egg viability. Although energy prices in Europe have dropped, analysts claim the cost of living crisis is far from over. A study on PFAS and their subgroup chemical PFAAs, PFAS, PFAS <laughs> determined that there's a boomerang effect, and some of the toxic PFAPs are readmitted to the air, transported long distances, and then deposited back onto land. On shorelines across the world, they end up, um, after time spent polluting the oceans. So, yeah, it's, it's that big circle again, you know. Zambia's worst cholera outbreak continues. Did you know that? Cholera. In the news, over 20,000 infected in the last six months. Russian authorities, and there's that country again, are reportedly trying to conceal the extent of cholera outbreak in occupied Mariupol. The megacity Bengaluru, population 14 million in India, is also experiencing a cholera surge. Dengue-stricken Argentina, did you know that, is, fend, is finding itself lacking a must-have item. Mosquito repellent. Add it to the prepper list. If you have relatives or friends in Argentina, send them. Send them some mosquito repellent. A Texas dairy worker contracted H5N1, that's what I was reading about, and scientists are sounding the alarm yet again that a human-to-human -human transmissible variant of bird flu would be unimaginably dangerous. Do you think countries would be able to contain such a, a pandemic if unleashed? Let's see. I think this was in and this was in the right-wing, stupid, clueless moron, New York Post, but they're warning people. That's interesting because they are pretty, uh, usually pretty right wing. A bird flu pandemic with the potential to be, oh, geez, continue without supporting us. I'm not going to support you. A bird flu pandemic with the potential to be 100 times worse than COVID may be on the horizon after um, a rare human case was discovered in Texas. Experts have warned. So it's a little fear porn there, but... People have to be 
You have to know what's happening with these things also. An H5N1 avian flu has spread rapidly since the new strain was detected in 2020, affecting wild birds in every state, as well in, as in commercial poultry and backyard flocks. But it has now even been detected in mammals with cattle herds across four states becoming infected. And on Monday, federal health officials announced that a dairy worker in Texas caught the virus. The virus has been on top of the pandemic list for many, many years and probably decades, said Dr. Uh, Kuchpudi, a bird flu researcher from Pittsburgh. And that was... Uh, they were in a panel discussion, so it could be a pandemic. So I guess we got to watch out for this shit too, right? Yeah, an ever-changing world. Ever-changing world. Now, for 30 years, the top causes of death in the United States were unchanged. Heart disease, cancer, accident, stroke, respiratory illness, in no particular order. And then came COVID, taking the silver medal for deaths in 2021. Oh, my goodness. And it's not funny. Antarctic Kriller being poisoned by microplastics. The unintentional introduction of microplastics to archaeological sites is threatening to alter the soil composition and spur breakdown of ancient remains. Isn't that lovely? My goodness. <sighs> Puntland, a state within Somalia, has withdrawn its recognition of the Somalia government following a constitu the constitutional changes allegedly made without their approval. So see how we're, we're moving into the war zone. Puntland, rich in oil, is distinct from Somaliland, a breakaway state which made a deal with Ethiopia and recently inflamed tensions in the Horn of Africa. Somalia is expelling Ethiopia's ambassador. Ethiopia's armed forces are also being accused of war crimes over uh, a January massacre in Amhara, you know? So everybody's getting along. And these are the zones where the fighting is happening. And Lebanese attacks have now displaced tens of thousands of Israelis living near the Israel-Lebanon border. Tens of thousands of Lebanese have been displaced as well after attacks and counterattacks continually interrupt what was once a fragile peace. Lebanon has now gone 17 months without a president. Their billionaire prime minister is under investigation for corruption. Some things don't change between countries. The revelation that Israel is using AI to help target militants is a portent of how machines are influencing the targeting cycle and what the future of machine assistant warfare might look like. It doesn't seem to me that it was so targeted to what they said they were targeting in Gaza. I don't know, unless they were just, you know, using AI and everyone's a militant, even if you're five years old. As famine grows in Gaza, pressure for a ceasefire grows and limited humanitarian aid is going to the powerful few with resources and will direct and the, and the will to direct the flow of resources. The killing of those seven aid workers is reshaping government and citizens positions on this conflict, though the weapons will still continue to flow to Israel. The Rafah offensive still looms near in the future, a city in southern Gaza housing 1.4 million people who are abandoning hope. The displacement of so many, coupled with a ground invasion, may serve as a bloody finale to, it, to this iteration of the Israel-Palestine conflict. The war on Hamas turned six months old. Today, it, this week, six months it's been a horrible six months. Absolutely horrible six months. A series of Russian strikes slew eight in Kharkiv, injuring more. A Ukrainian drone strike reportedly destroyed six Russian planes near Rostov. Excuse me. I'm drinking um, club soda. <laughs> Many more Ukrainian drones were shot down, according to Russian spokespeople. 
Reports are also emerging of Russian forces using chemical weapons, namely various gases. Oh, that's uh, that's always so nice. <laughs> Against the frontline forces, another violation of international law. So that's a big clusterfuck, Ukraine. I hate war, but I feel so sad for that country because the people don't want to be a part of another country. They want to be Ukraine. On NATO's 75th anniversary on Thursday, a Kremlin spokesperson admitted that NATO and Russia are in direct confrontation. The Czech Republic posted record arms sales. Ukraine is also running low on air defense missiles because Russia is waging a kind of economic supply warfare. It's cheaper to make missiles than to stop them. Germany has proposed reforms to its army, the Bundeswehr, to be implemented by October. The secretary, the American Secretary of State claimed that one day Ukraine will join NATO. Everybody just wants to be in that circular cluster mess. Myanmar rebel forces launched two drone strikes against the junta or junta controlled capital. Later in the week, the rebels seized an important town on the border with Thailand capturing capturing hundreds of junta soldiers. (laughs) Violence is tearing apart the remnants of Haitian society. The country has become a an open-air prison for its nearly 12 million inhabitants. 18 Balachi terror group militants killed 10 Iranian soldiers in southeast Iran over opposition to the Iranian regime before being killed. Armenians continue to worry over a potential Azeri invasion to secure a road through Armenian territory to their large enclave. A mayor of a Mexican city was shot and killed while dining at a restaurant. Cyprus's interior minister said the country is reaching a breaking point because of Syrian migrants coming from Lebanon, mostly young men. Tensions between Cyprus and the long Turkish-occupied half of the island have been inflamed a bit after the UN Secretary General extended efforts to mediate the 50-year-old conflict. Ecuadorian forces raided the Mexican embassy in Quito to capture the former Ecuadorian vice president in an incident which has caused Mexico to break off diplomatic ties with Ecuador. Protests happening in Argentina over the cutting of 15,000 jobs and other government spending. That's because they have a new president, and I forgot his, his name escapes me, so if you have his name... I'll see if I can see it. I The new president of Argentina, who's supposedly, you know, really a jerk, blowing things up. So people are protesting. Let, let's see that article. It's in the Independent. Let's see the pictures. Argentina said it had 15,000 state jobs as part of, pre- oh, here it is, President Javier Millet's aggressive campaign to slash spending. Now, What's going to happen in the United States when we have Steve Bannon's administrative state? They want to get rid of like a lot of people in the government. They want to do the same thing here. Okay. That's why I am always saying civil rights is on the ballot because they want to get rid of the people that take care of us, our well-being. 15,000. So this, see, they're protesting. This guy, Argentina said Wednesday that it had cut 15,000 state jobs as part of President Javier Millet. Is it Millet? His aggressive campaign to slash the spending, the latest in a series of painful economic measures that have put the libertarian government on a collision course with angry protesters and powerful trade unions. So libertarians suck. I mean, I remember when Libertarian was, oh, it's really cool, man. They just say freedom of smoke and dope and all. No, they're the scorched earth party. And they will ruin the planet given the chance. And that's what's happening down in Argentina. So hundreds of defiant employees, some notified of their termination last Wednesday and others fired in past weeks, stormed their workplaces in Buenos Aires and nearby cities Wednesday, beating drums, decrying their dismissal as unjust and demanding their reinstatement. Oh, what a mess down there.
These layoffs have a face. They have a family. They have real needs in this context of great change and great poverty in Argentina. And I'm telling you, it could be 2025 in the United States. And I'm not giving you fear porn, folks. The Philippines is preparing for an escalation with China concerning a, several thwarted Filipino attempts to resupply the BRO Sierra Madre, a rusty Filipino landing ship deliberately grounded 25 years ago on a contested shoal in the South China Sea. So there we go. I had one more article. Oh, this was the Parasite article. I can't forget this one. This was on the, uh, they sound the alarm after examining the Antarctic krill. Even the polar environment is not free. There's a connection between what we do in our daily lives and even the most isolated regions in the world. So we'll close up with this one. Even the tiniest of the marine animals are at risk. So what happened? According to a report by Sarah in June, two studies of the Southern Ocean near Antarctica revealed that Antarctic krill ingest various types of microplastics, especially fibers from clothing and other textiles. That's why I probably have everything I've ever had for the last 40 years. I don't want to get rid of it and hurt animals. <laughs> The discovery spotlighted how even remote environments can be impacted by our plast uh, plastic use. Even the polar environment is not free. It's not free. And there's another study. Measured microplastics in krill as well as jellyfish. Uh, creatures called uh, the salps. While microplastics were found in both animals, the salps contain fewer but larger particles than the krill. Isn't that just lovely. Yeah. So around the world, I take you, yes, it is not totally fun. Um, but I guess I, I will say, well, I guess somebody's got to do it, right? And I just did it. So let's look at some of your comments before we go. And uh, how are you guys doing out there? I really appreciate you being here. Yeah, we didn't evolve to prevent global warming, Deborah. right? My goodness. Oh, it could be. Younger people have more PFAS because they got the high dose in utero, which we older guys didn't have. Maybe. We just had more years of lousy products, I suppose. But that is a very interesting comment, Hillary. Thank you. Thank you and welcome. Uh... Let's see here. If most people weren't plain stupid, we wouldn't be in this dire situation. <laughs> well, I can only speak for the United States of clueless fucking morons. <laughs> but, you know, um, Gary, Gary, Re, PFAPs and such. Sandy, please interview folks from the shutdown Red Hill Coalition on Oahu and Hawaii. Jeff Fuel in the Aquifier for the island that... Oh, that mostly no as Honolulu. Okay, I'm going to keep that one. Thank you. I need a, I need like somebody to um, work with me, <laughs> write emails. <laughs> but it's not a job; it's a hobby. So I'll get it done. I'll get it done. Steve, you said, um, Trulia. I was actually in the Battle Creek neighborhood of St. Paul, 3M Poison Battle Creek that runs right through their campus and flows directly into Mississippi. Jeez, lovely, huh? Hello, Channel Warhorse. War Horse. And what are you saying? Um, Fight for the Future, publish on Amazon books for people like Greta Thunberg to upset fossil fuel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do anything to upset the status quo. Put a monkey wrench in the apple cart. I, I'm all for it. I may be getting old and my body's breaking down, but I, I'm all in it. I'm all in. I, I, I don't know. I'm all in for activism. I know. I can't either. It's horrible. It's pretty, it's pretty bad. War. But, but see, how many wars have I lived through and protested, went to D.C.? It just doesn't end. It doesn't end. Why? Do, I mean... Doomer adjacent. <laughs> oh my God. Yes. 
We can try to form beloved communities where we are. These beloved communities need to center on the more human species in the community, on, mo- on the more human, more than human species in the community of life. Absolutely. And that's what Lyle was talking about that I interviewed. And any place where fire retardants use is polluted. Absolutely. And all those fires that happen in, in the West, all over the world, the airplanes that are flying down. Yeah. All right. Well, we're almost to the hour. And this, you know, yeah. Let Greta inspire my kids. I'm not her critic. I'm a supporter of balance and the good that is needed. Exactly. Me too. There's, a, you know, there's some controversy on on uh, on X over the whole Doomer name and label and Michael Mann again coming out and having a speech at Harvard and saying that the name, it's, it's, it's so ridiculous. We all are seeing our eyes are open we know what's happening look at what jared brock puts together for me to read which he doesn't really for me but he's wonderful yes good point by gary beautiful point by gary we have a beautiful chat beautiful followers no the news may be distressing but we're together And by the way, I'll have Karen Perry as my guest for Friday. And she is, she she and her husband have um, kind of taken over for Michael Dowd's Post Doom No Gloom. She runs a collapse support group. It's going to be very interesting. She's been my guest before. So she's coming on Friday night. And we just need support. And even if we are here or away from each other. Yeah, the upside of doomerism. And it's not even, you know, like I say, I'm doomer adjacent, whatever you want to call it. We see the big picture, but certainly never sit back. Even the stupid little things. My friend Debbie's coming over tomorrow, and she's going to fill me in on all these things that we want to do around here for our community. And building community. I am with my neighbors where I went yesterday for the eclipse. And we just, I walked across the street and it it was incredible. And it got dark. It was like really cool. And I was making fun of it the whole week before. And I didn't know what was going to happen. So yeah. Yep. Armenian enclave. Any enclave is collapse support and oxymoron. Well, ask her. Come on Friday night. I'm sure you'll like Karen. I don't know if you saw my interview with her before, but yeah, collapse support. That's like the other night I said, well, you know, I don't want to do ads on the channel anymore. There's no reason and nobody, I, I, it's like, who is going to put an ad on a show that's last week in collapse? Bridge support salespeople. <laughs> so I mean, it's like stupid. I don't, uh, there won't be. Yeah, it is going to be a good show Friday. It's going to definitely be a good show. Well, it's really good to see all of you. And yep, tomorrow night we are on Left Past 10. And we have Sandy Lovis from Canada with us on left from left of the box. So that should be fun. Um, Tragedies of the Commons also knows as as collective action dilemmas and public goods games in which actions that benefit the individual may harm the community. Familiar examples include, oh my goodness, I'll have to find that. Yes, Karen has a good heart for more than human beloved community life. I'm glad you're having her. I love her. This could be my second time. We've been chatting for weeks now. So yeah. Oh, here, here we go. Let's finish this one. Uh, Familiar examples, overfishing, highway congestion, tax evasion, carbon emissions. And they have drawn normative, moral, and political conclusion from these scientific beliefs such that, my gosh, I should have you come on the channel. Absolutely. All right. Well, we're, we're pretty much done. What did you say? They put, oh my gosh, I have to take that down. (laughs) Oh, well, I'm not. I'm not advertising. (laughs) So what does it matter? Yeah. 
Michael, man, he needs to leverage his shit into human newer combos. <laughs> oh, there's a whole big thing on on Twitter. It was my fault because I posted I posted the article and said, I don't see things changing when, you know, I don't see things. I saw or I asked the question hypothetically, how come things are getting worse? I mean, I don't mean to be like that. I just don't see that in what I look at that it's the time to dance. <laughs> yes, sacrifice for the good of the group over an every man for himself individualism. I like that. And I think, and I'm not dissing him. I'm not. I'm not dissing anybody. I said it. I just said it. I just wish he would stop with the doomer shit. That's all. That's all I wish. Just stop. We really all have to figure this out together. And that's all I'm saying. And I understand what you're saying, climate teacher, John. I completely am. Anyway, ah, Nina, you're a love. May you have a good day in your soil and seeds tomorrow. That's right. I have been. And you know, it hurts, but it's that good kind of pain when you're out there and you're doing your stuff outside and yeah, whatever. I just don't lift a lot, but shit gets done and it's a good feeling. So no matter how bad the world is, we have our local communities. We have our friends. We have on here, right? Yeah, I know. How? Why wouldn't they get worse? We're not doing anything different or better. Well, not politically. Anywhere in the world. Yeah. We're a fun coffee house. Absolutely. Ah! <laughs> yeah, you did. But then I realized I'm not putting an ad on this. So what's the difference? <laughs> Oh, man. I have fun. Feel the burn. All right, guys. Good night. It, it's really, it's been fun. Exactly, Sandy. It's not the doomers that keep lying about our predicament. Sorry, but people should know how bad things are to make informed decisions. Steph, she's she is my ex-buddy. Twitter buddy. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, it is. It is human nature. I love you guys. This is the best chat. Human nature. Wait, wait, wait. Human nature to look for scapegoats. You guys fucking rock. I'm telling you. Slapping doomer on someone because they look at critical factors. That kind of repulsive. Well, but he does. I wish he would stop. That's all. I just want him to stop. Anyway. All right. I'm ending with Gary. I love you. Right on, Sandy. We are all in this extinction event together. None of us knows or controls the outcomes. We can love all of life as, as best as we can. And I, I did yesterday. I really did. I loved life yesterday. And I get, you know, yeah, I get sad at times and everybody knows when I am, <laughs> but tonight I don't feel that way. And that's because I'm telling you hard work as much as it kills me and I, and I suffer, it's worth it, you know, and, uh, it's definitely worth it. And hopefully I'll be able to actually take videos of doing things as a disabled person although I changed the disabled able gardener to the Anthropocene gardener, but I can show people that they can do certain things too, even with disabilities. So we advocate for those out there that feel like they can't to maybe have a shot and maybe feel like you can. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. I had to put that one in. All right, guys, I will see you Friday with Karen. I will see you tomorrow night with, um, left past 10 and that, that should be fun with Sandy from Canada. I love you guys. Love you guys.